Welcome to the Water Habitat presentation from Water Quality Basics. The first three levels of the stream function pyramid create the habitat conditions available for aquatic life. We're going to walk through a habitat assessment method that is based on the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Rapid Bioassessment Protocol. Through this, we'll evaluate the quality and quantity of physical habitat structures in the stream and use the established parameters for habitat quality ratings based on high and low gradient streams. For accurate assessments, it's important to conduct your observations during the designated sampling periods for headwater or weightable stream sizes. Also, assessments should not be conducted during very high or very low flow conditions or within two weeks of a known scouring event during which habitat in the stream bed has been impacted by high flows. When assessing aquatic habitat in Kentucky, we approach it differently depending on the stream's gradient or slope. In most areas of the state, streams have a higher gradient or steeper slope. But in a few areas of the state, mainly in western Kentucky, we see streams with a much lower gradient or gentler slope due to the flatter topography of the region. Let's take a look at the differences between these two types of streams. As we mentioned, high gradient streams have steeper slopes or gradients, which in turn causes more rapid stream flow and Riffle habitat dominates. These are the exposed rocks at or near the surface. High gradient streams are commonly found in Kentucky's mountain, bluegrass, and pennyroyal bioregions. High gradient streams produce a greater range of flow depths and speeds, including pools or the deep areas with slow flow, Riffles, where the stream elevation drops and bedrocks break the surface, creating turbulence with rough, bubbly, oxygenated water, and runs, or the fast, shallower stream segments between the riffles and pools. For this reason, high gradient streams have a good variety of niche habitats. In contrast, low gradient, gradient streams are found in flatter terrain, and have a slower stream flow rate. They lack the riffle habitat seen in the higher gradient streams and are commonly found in Western Kentucky's Mississippi Valley bioregions. Flow depths and speeds are more limited to pools and runs in low gradient streams. So we don't really see true riffles in the low gradient streams of Western Kentucky. There are two different habitat assessment forms for high and low gradient, so it's important to make sure that you are using the correct form for the stream you are assessing. These are the 10 conditions or parameters of streams that are typically assessed for habitat quality. Referring back to our functional pyramid, the habitat assessment is providing a way to evaluate how the hydrology, hydraulics, and geomorphology provide support for the biology. Some per parameters, such as numbers 1 and 4, assess the same general characteristic for high versus low gradient streams, but the rating criteria are slightly different. For example, with number 4, sediment deposition, you'd naturally expect to see less sediment deposition in faster moving high gradient streams than you would see in slower moving low gradient streams. So the evaluations are slightly different. Some parameters specify different considerations. For example, for high gradient streams, we look at the velocity depth regime of the flow types. In number three, but since low gradient streams mainly only display pools, we assess the variability of pool types for characteristic number three. Each parameter is assessed and rated on a scale from zero to 20. Then all of the ratings are totaled to derive a habitat ranking for the site. 
The habitat ranking is then compared against the reference or ideal condition to make an assessment relative to the region. Using your field data sheet, you evaluate each of the habitat parameters we just listed within a defined stream segment length. We look at the individual features and determine how well they are functioning individually. It may be helpful to imagine the stream from a macroinvertebrate's perspective. These are then combined into one overall measurement of how livable the stream is for the stream animals. Performing the habitat and biological assessments annually will help us to see changes over time that could affect stream health. This is why it's important to be as consistent as possible each time these assessments are performed. Each habitat parameter is rated using four condition categories, from poor to marginal to suboptimal to optimal. These must be carefully read to determine which one most closely matches the observed condition in your stream. Then, within each condition category, users assign one of the five numerical scores to represent how closely the condition of the stream matches that particular category's description. For some parameters, such as bank stability, vegetative protection, and riparian zone width, each stream bank is assessed separately. We've talked about the bioregions and the occurrence of high or low gradient streams. As you can see, the four bioregions in Kentucky are from west to east, the Mississippi Valley, Interior River Lowland, Penny Royal, Bluegrass, and Mountain. As you can see, low gradient streams are found in the MVIR, or Mississippi Valley, bioregion, and the other three have high gradient streams. When evaluating field score totals from your habitat assessment, we also consider the stream's bioregion location and whether we are assessing a headwater or a weightable stream depending on the contributing watershed area. A headwater stream has a smaller drainage area of less than five square miles, and for this reason, tends to be a smaller size stream. A weightable stream has a larger drainage area of greater than five square miles. Here are representative photos of the four bioregions in Kentucky. Note the variations in flow type from the mountains to bluegrass to pennyroyal to the Mississippi Valley interior river regions. Let's start with the first parameter, epiphonal substrate and available cover. This is generally the same for both high and low gradient streams. The epiphonal substrate characteristics of the stream refer to the available cover for animals that live on the bottom of the stream. This could include submerged logs, undercut stream banks, and larger rocks or cobble that appear to been in, have been in place for a while and are unlikely to move. We'll ideally see these habitat types around the riffle areas of the stream that are favorable for fish colonization and cover. Since they're largely around riffles, they're, we're more likely to see them in higher gradient streams than low gradient streams. And so we do rank those two types of streams slightly differently for this characteristic. The next indicator is one that differs more significantly for high versus low gradient streams. In a high gradient stream, we'll be looking at embeddedness which refers to how much of the rocks or tree snags on the bottom of the stream are covered or surrounded by silt and sediment. You can see in this slide on the left, the optimal condition has very little sediment around the rocks, whereas the poor example on the right is the ro shows rocks that are largely covered by sediment. This is important because when we have a mix of gravel, cobble, and boulder particles that are minimally surrounded, you'll have more surface area for macroinvertebrate and fish shelter spawning and feeding. And the layering of cobble-sized rocks also creates a diversity of spaces for aquatic organisms to live and reproduce. 
Conditions are ideal when less than 25% of these variously sized rocks and snags are surrounded by fine sediments. And conditions are considered poor when rocks and snags are more than 75% surrounded. This is a graphic depiction of what we are considering for this parameter. You can see how the rocks become more covered by sediment as you move from optimal toward poor conditions on the right. In contrast, for low gradient streams, we're going to be looking at pool substrate characterization. Remember that with these lower gradient streams, we have slower flows and therefore less stream velocity to move larger rocks along the stream bed. This results in more pooled water and allows more aquatic vegetation to grow. We will still want to see a variety of habitat niche types at the bottom of the pool, which will include a mixture of gravel and sand substrates and abundant aquatic plants and associated root mats. When the stream substrate is all mud and clay, or even all bedrock with very little to no vegetation and root mats, scoring for this category is poor. Parameter number three is for velocity and depth regime, again specific to high gradient streams. As previously mentioned, unaltered high gradient streams should display a sequence of stream velocities and depths that creates a variety of habitat types. These will include four velocity depth regimes, slow deep waters called pools, slow shallow waters called glides, fast deep water called the run, and a fast shallow area of water called the riffle. The fewer of these profiles observed, the less ideal the stream habitat is. So you can see in the example on the right, it's mainly just pooled water, which has a lot less variety in habitat. For low gradient streams, we'll be looking for an even mix of different types of pools for a good diversity of aquatic habitat. These will include pools that are large and shallow, large and deep, small and shallow, and small and deep. When the majority of pools are small and shallow or absent, this habitat indicator is rated as poor. The next few parameters are the same for high and low gradient stream assessments. Sediment deposition is another measurement of how much sedimentation is affecting the availability of a variety of habitat niches, with embeddedness being the other one we've covered. This metric estimates the amount of sediment that has accumulated in pools and changes that have occurred in the stream bottom as a, rep as a result of deposition. If there's a lot of dirt being washed into a stream or worn away from the stream banks and carried by the water, it will settle where the water is slowed down by a curve in the stream, a tree that's fallen, or a large rock or bridge or other impediment. As more sediment begins to collect, the water is slowed down even further, so more sediment settles there. This will cause an island or point bar to form and appear above the surface of the water, or it can cause the filling in of runs or pools. So a point bar is a ridge of sediment deposited by a stream on the inside of a bend. It can be located below the surface of the water or extend above it. This is a natural process, but too much sediment in the stream will cause too many islands and point bars. These can even eventually cover the entire width of the stream. Also, they will move and change frequently and don't provide good long-term places for aquatic organisms to live. So lesser evidence of point bar formation is a sign of better habitat conditions, and more evidence of point bars is a sign of poorer habitat conditions. Channel flow status assesses how much of the channel is carrying the flow of the stream. Is the water extending to both lower banks with a minimal amount of the substrate exposed? Or is the channel carrying very little water with much of the substrate exposed and water present mainly only in standing pools? 
Ideally, the flow will extend to both banks and all substrate habitats will be covered with healthy flow levels. This ensures a broader range of stable aquatic habitat. To adequately assess your stream habitat, beginning with this parameter and through parameter 10, you're going to include an additional 100 meter upstream segment from where you've originally started. So channel alteration refers to how much human activities have straightened or channelized the stream. This can include things like artificial embankments, riprap, and other forms of bank stabilization structures. Significant stretches of straightened stream, such as the example on the right, dams and bridges that are obstructing flow, and other evidence of dredging or substrate mining, such as that for gravel, sand, and silt. You can see the optimal stream on the left has much more sinuosity or bend to it as compared to the one on the right. For high gradient streams only, we assess riffle frequency. Mountainous or hilly terrain creates streams with more frequent riffles. For this parameter, you'll calculate the distance between riffles divided by the stream width to help determine your condition category rating. In addition to the variety of habitat indicated by riffle frequency, the presence of riffles also signals the availability of well oxygenated water that is ideal for aquatic life. For low gradient streams, you'll consider channel sinuosity instead of riffle frequency. This parameter characterizes characterizes the meandering or sinuosity of the stream. Curves or bends in the stream increase stream length, which reduces the force or energy of flows, also reducing erosion and improving stream habitat. Thus, a high degree of sinuosity provides for better habitat and fauna, and the stream is better able to handle storm surges. Straightened channels do the opposite increasing flow velocity and erosion and damaging stream habitat. Next, let's consider bank stability, or how much the banks have eroded and how much more erosion is likely. When large areas of bare dirt, exposed tree roots, undercut banks, and trees falling into the stream are seen along the banks, it's a sign that they aren't stable. Ideally, you'll see very minimal evidence of erosion of the stream banks, when le with less than 5% being optimal and 60 to 100% being poor. Eroding sediment covers up and fills in the places where animals live. Also, the high levels of mud and sediment in the water makes it difficult for fish and other stream animals to absorb dissolved oxygen they need and make it, makes it difficult for them to find food. For this parameter, you'll face downstream and evaluate the left bank and right bank separately. Next, we'll look at vegetative protection, which refers to the availability and variety of vegetation immediately adjacent to the stream and in the near stream portion of the riparian zone. Ideally, you'll see more than 90% of this area covered by native vegetation, including trees, understory shrubs, or non-woody plants. And you would not want to see much in the way of grazing or mowing of the vegetation. This allows for better erosion control and a wider variety of food material for aquatic organisms. In the photo on the left, you can see there's plenty, plentiful variety of vegetation on both banks, whereas on the right, both banks have light vegetation, mainly grasses with only a few trees, and it looks like some grazing has occurred in this area. Finally, we'll be looking at riparian vegetative zone width on both sides of the stream. Remember that the riparian zone refers to the land along and adjacent to a stream or river. We're interested in the amount of this zone that is filled by trees, shrubs, and grasses. The width 
and amount of vegetative cover in this zone are determinants of its effectiveness in providing ideal aquatic habitat, as well as absorbing and removing excess stream storm water and removing associated pollutants. Ideally, the buffer width will be greater than 50 feet on each side of the stream and provide a variety of vegetation types with little to no mowing or other human impacts. On these photos, you can see a contrast between the optimal conditions on the left with abundant vegetative cover on both sides of the stream versus the stream on the right that has been severely mowed on both banks and has parking lots and roadways that interfere with the riparian buffer width. In summary, we began by explaining that streams in Kentucky are categorized by gradient, with higher gradient streams found in steeper terrain and having faster, shallower water flows with more riffle areas and lower gradient streams found in flatter terrain, mainly in western Kentucky, having slower, deeper flows with more pool habitat. Once you know the type of stream gradient you have, you'll use the habitat assessment field data sheet to evaluate 10 habitat parameters or categories, and you'll rate each of those parameters individually from a poor to marginal, suboptimal to optimal rating. In the end, you'll come up with an overall habitat score for your stream that will help you better understand how well it can support aquatic life and where your weaknesses are that you may need to target in any stream improvements.